value in the early 2000s. So they're not inclined to invest capital in large mining projects right now. So they're doing share buybacks, dividend yields, really making returns to shareholders. And I think Yakub, who's the CEO of Rio and has invested a discussions in October, said they really have to be incentivized to think about investment in large mining projects. Uh, so the majors are really parked uh, in terms of capital investment. The juniors are finding it really hard to access capital for projects. Um, so that's kind of that landscape in the mining industry. And then, uh, incidentally, we have, uh, and some of the private equity funds that are focused on mining are here today, and they have capital and looking at investing in mining companies and juniors. Uh, and I was talking to the head of ESG for Bridgewater, who's a $140 billion asset manager. And they're looking at, you know, from an asset management perspective, at mining companies for the first time ever, but with a view of, you know, the future minerals for uh, electrification, but mines that are responsibly mined, not, not the regular mining. So it's kind of a, a tale of two worlds in my mind. And yesterday I attended the minister's roundtable, and it's actually the minister of mines uh, for Saudi Arabia said we have three hurdles in the context of Saudi Arabia. One is uh, we have... Uh, lack of exploration, so that's a capital opportunity. We have lack of infrastructure, another capital opportunity. And the third thing, which is kind of more of an opportunity, is kind of the regional hub. And as Saudi Arabia becomes kind of a center to bring North and East Africa and Central Asia together in the Middle East, uh, and particularly as you distribute mining and midstream downstream activities, again, capital is required to enable that. Uh, and as all, we all know, capital just goes where the returns are. Uh, and I think increasingly capital is going to be, A, we need the minerals, but we need the minerals to be mined in certain ways to satisfy, I call it, the ESG needs of the general motors of the world that are under pressure to do responsibly sourced cars. So we're very fortunate. We've got two great panels, and then I'm doing a uh, fireside chat with the CFO of Marden uh, at the end. So to explore uh, the things that I've talked about, which are both opportunities and challenges, and uh, the other areas. So what I'd like to do is... Uh, Call Tom, who's uh, the CEO of Dragon, chair of the Saudi Australian Business Council from Melbourne, who's our moderator for our first panel. Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you much, Peter. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, what I'd like to do is, is first of all introduce the panel, my panel, and ask them to come up and join me, those that aren't already behind me. So the, the first is Dr. Ibrahim Almafel, who's CEO of the Saudi Industrial Development Fund. Um, uh, Jonathan Cordero, who's head of corporate development at the Eurasian Resources Group. Um, and behind me, um, I think on my, above me, <laughs> is, is, is uh, Jeffrey Steiner, who's uh, chairman of the Canada Saudi Arabian Business Council. Um, and in the middle, uh, behind Ibrahim, is Peter Groskop, who's Chief Executive uh, Officer of Sprott. And then uh, on the top right is uh, Richard Horrocks Taylor, Global Head of mining, uh, uh, Metals and Mining at Standard and Chartered. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased that they're all here because they can add a lot more than I can. Uh, but I wanted to use the opportunity to, to do a bit of a scene setter. I think um, the environment frames a lot of this conversation. And I want to point to what I regard as seven very significant things. One, we're experiencing a disruption of what has been a settled trading order for 20 years. COVID, the rise of China as a power, and the immediacy of climate concerns are immensely influential factors. Secondly, mineral resources are no less fundamental to social needs, but have a changed social context and political character in both the communities in which they are located and the manner of their extraction and processing. Third, climate policies are in an evolutionary phase. Four, consumers are becoming influential in supply chains and the nature of sourcing. Five, financing is conditioned by consumer and social influences far more than it ever has been. Six, state concerns are central to resource development and processing. And seven, we have a wide range of strategic minerals. 
So let me, before I plunge further into this, acknowledge and thank our hosts and commend the initiative uh, of addressing the future of mining. Because the question really posed, I think, to this session is not invest or divest, but how, do, how to invest. How do you solve for providing capital for mining to produce the metals and other commodities that the world demands uh, to enable the energy transition? Mining and the whole value chain that supports it, exploration, engineering, processing, energy use, rehabilitation, and so on, are more important than any time in my lifetime. And I spent uh, 25 years at BHP. For mining, is not just about furnishing the commodities for a growing economy, it's now the key enabler of the energy transition. And thus there should be no conflict between the extractive industries, particularly mining and sustaining life on this planet. The crux of the question is how do we meet the growing demand and pass through the eye of the ESG needle? My business, Dragoman, advises companies on, among other things, how to strike a durable and efficacious social contract. Personally, I like the concept of a social contract. It's a way of a company establishing its license to operate and to test it. Energy transition demands enormous amounts of new infrastructure, as Peter just said. New energy technologies, renewables, batteries, electric vehicles, will determine the boom commodities of the future. Commodity, lithium, critical minerals. And there's an old economist's adage that high prices are the cure for high prices. However, mining development has a long lead time, in excess of 10 years. So even if higher prices incentivize new production, there's a lag where prices may remain persistently high. The rate of change demanded by the 2050, or in some cases the 2060 net zero targets, is so great that there's a significant chance of disruption to supply and a prolonged high price cycle in some commodities. Jeremy Weir of Trafigura and Mark Bristow this morning of Barrick see a significant deficit in copper markets possibly in the region of 10 million tonnes required to balance the market by 2030. The decarbonisation imperative will likely force buyers to accept higher prices unless, unless alternative technologies can be found. This presents an opportunity for forward-looking miners. Climate sustainability is not the sole imperative driving the need for mining. Other macro trends bearing on the sector include population growth and the global food needs, phosphate demand. At the same time that there has been a radical philosophical shift in cap capital markets, investors are scrutinizing companies, ESG performance, which incorporates everything from emissions, environmental and biodiversity impacts to the way companies deal with the communities they operate in the structure of their supply chains, and the way they deal with government. For me, the taxonomy of ESG is not settled and provides another layer of uncertainty to investment decisions. I'll end this opening with the observation that a large responsibility lies on all of us to ensure a sophisticated understanding of the criticality of the mining process to sustainability. We need, we need to avoid, for example, the simplistic binary thinking some apply in pa painting extractive industries as antagonistic to sustainability, whereas when it's done well, it is not just a key enabler, it is mission critical. So thank you uh, for indulging me in my opening <laughs> remarks. Uh, so let me, let me now turn to uh, the only Saudi member of our panel, um, so Dr. Ibrahim. Um, how is Saudi doing it? H how will it happen? Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the question, but also and for having me here. And thanks for the uh, opening remarks. I just want to re-emphasize something you mentioned, and then we'll move into Saudi and the role of SIDF in, in within the kingdom. I think a lot of things caught my attention, but I'll highlight that, it's not that it is mission critical. 
if we want to go into this transition, mining is mission critical. So we see a huge demand, uh, sevenfold, four to sevenfold in some uh, demand increase in some calculations driven by whether it's renewables or the circular carbon economy direction or the electrification of mobility. And, and that creates an opportunity. Now, we can use that opportunity and leverage it in a way that will align with the objectives of that transition, with the environmental uh, goals of that transition or otherwise. The kingdom is choosing to be aligned with it. The declaration of net zero by His Royal Highness uh, a couple of months ago, things struck many as very ambitious, but we're already seeing the results or the decisions made toward that end. Um, the, today's forum is an example of Saudi trying to play a regional role mm -hmm. in bringing uh, from Central Asia to Africa the discussion, and as the CEO of Barak said, this is the first time in his career seeing something like this driven by a government, not in spite of governments. In Saudi, we identified opportunities uh, that are valued at $1.3 trillion, 70% of which are in copper, zinc, uh, uh, phosphate, and gold. So they are in the mission critical aspects of the transition or to enable the agriculture in the, in the, in the world. Um, and to do that, we launched a new strategy that has three pillars. First, increased data availability and transparency. Uh, we announced a, one of the largest uh, surveys in the world, covering 700,000 square kilometers. Second, developing the value chain around the industry. And as His Excellency, the minister, said earlier this morning, that it's imperative to do so before mining to make sure the inputs needed for the mining activity are available, and post-mining to create the needed logistics and demand uh, centers for the outcomes of the mining industry. And third, to enhance the investor journey and provide sustainable financing. This brings me to the last point where SIDF role. SIDF were the main financial enabler to the transition of the kingdom into an industrial powerhouse and a logistical global logistical hub. For mining, throughout the history of the fund, we ac approved loans of around $8 billion. That's before mining being central to what we do. With a, trans with a change of the mandate that we went through with the Vision 2030, um, we are uh, beginning from the last pa parts of uh, exploration, delineation, until uh, end of the mine. We finance up to 75% of total capex for loans up to 20% at a fixed rate in an increased inflation um, a driven economy now in a, with a fixed rate from 2 to 3 uh, percent. This year alone, we will spend 2 billion riyals on mining projects. Last year, we spent 2 billion riyals on mining projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we might now go to Jonathan. And I, 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 you, you said you'd like particularly to address the technology, technology and its role. True. I think our industry has challenges. Yeah, not only capital, but at the same time we're facing uh, very complex uh, global supply chains. We've seen it during during COVID pandemic, how fragile our global supply chains are in the mineral resource space. Um, and at the same time, at the, at the, on the asset side, we see depleting grades. This is just the nature of our business, uh, depleting and deteriorating grades on the various sides. Um, so you very much highlighted what needs to happen on the on the supply side uh, quadruple sevenfold um, that needs to come from the supply side so uh, this growth can only come from from taking adopting and developing new technologies in in our industry in order to challenge tackle these issues that we have in the industry so on the one hand capital yes and the development uh, of um, of new technologies in our space in a very holistic and in a uh, in a framework that that allows to operate as a miner yeah, that being a social license to operate we heard the term a, a lot um, the political environment and the legal framework and I think uh, the kingdom has done here very an exemplary uh, process of really ticking the boxes to make foreign direct investments possible thank you very much 
Um, might now turn to Canada. Jeffrey, um, would you like uh, to, to give us your insights? Well, I'm, firstly, I, it's a privilege to be with you and um, on, this, on this panel. And of course, all Canadians are involved in mining one way or other. It's, uh, it's in our blood. Um, and so I really have to salute the, the kingdom for making mining a big part of their strategy, the 2030 vision, but also this conference bringing together in a, as a regional hub uh, the regional neighbors. Uh, it's, it's quite a tremendous um, and smart thing to do. And so uh, bringing Canadian capabilities, which are well known to help uh, with the goals of uh, Vision 2030 and to um, spread uh, mi modern mining practices uh, is something that I think Canadians can, can really help with. Um, I'm very bullish and optimistic on the uh, opportunities, the need for capital, because uh, mining is, is maybe not what people envision of 20 and 30 years ago. The, the technology, clean tech, robotics, AI, worker uh, safety, um, the digitization of mining, this is a very advanced uh, industry. Um, that has been focused on CSR, uh, which is a, you know, ESG is a new variant of, uh, of CS, uh, CSR. And so modern mining uh, standards, of course, uh, Canadian uh, capabilities are focused on, on environmental and social um, outcomes. This is an area actually of strength in the industry. Uh, Peter earlier talked about, um, you know, the returns for investors has been mostly where capital costs were way over uh, estimations. And so there's an area where we can use some, uh, some more people and the discipline of private equity and, and the banking community uh, to make sure that the mining companies uh, can deliver these capital investments and, and deliver these new technologies um, on, on, a, on a reasonable basis. And I think they can. And I guess the only thing, last thing I, I'd say uh, Tom is, you know, the industry being confused perhaps with anti-environmental or what have you is maybe really only in thermal coal. Um, I think there's a consensus. Uh, the international financial institutions won't back thermal coal projects, but in the rest of the extracted commodities that are important to the future, uh, I think we'll see a robust uh, investor interest. And lastly, of course, it really all starts with exploration. Uh, governments uh, uh, need to be focused on how to encourage uh, and reduce risk in exploration. And I noticed that in Saudi Arabia, the Ministry of Industry and Minerals Resources is already trying to do that with geo, geotechnical, aerial, um, geophysics, etc. So don't want to go on too long as a Canadian, but I really salute uh, this focus on, on mining. And it really is a tech sector uh, for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, we might turn to Peter next. Um, and Peter um, manages uh, a whole lot of funds and runs a physical uranium trust and physical bullion funds, um, uh, which are both directly relevant to, the, to, 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 to our subject. I'm, 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 I'm intrigued by uranium, do you, do, do, do you, uh, but I, I, won't make this, I won't ask you to direct all your remarks to this, but I'm just interested in, in the environmental acceptability of uranium mining. Sure, and I, I'd be happy to touch on that. Delighted to be here and to see the enthusiasm of this large group. I think the good news is the mining sector for investments has matured considerably since the days of the gold bugs and also since the super cycle and which folks in the investment world thought would never end. Uh, there are less sector funds. Uh, a lot of those monies have gone to ETFs, but there are considerably more generalists participating in the sector. And we are seeing a much broader appetite across the spectrum from venture and early stage drilling type funds on through to large scale development and multi mine acquisition vehicles. Uh, these are being supplied by PE funds, structured funds, hedge funds, 
and large generalist investors all the way through to endowments and even some sovereign investors. So it is a healthy, growing sector, and we see interests and um, incoming um, incoming investor interests uh, growing each year. There are challenges. I think the bar has been raised considerably and that the hurdles are higher. So there are more needs across the permitting side, social license, and certainly as we will see, we saw last year, we will see this year on the engineering and costing side where um, there's increasing diligence and the need for good information. Uh, these all lead to longer timelines and more expensive projects, unfortunately, and there are higher market cap hurdles for public companies. Of course, higher ESG standards just in general, there are more boxes to tick for companies as they achieve their investment capital. Just touching on uranium to answer your question, it's a sector that was left for dead. Um, as um, many governments and a, a couple of well-known uh, accidents prevented um, the sector from growing. And in fact, many countries decided on decommissioning nuclear capacity. Um, we just don't see that the numbers stack up for a clean decarbonized grid without the major backing of nuclear power. And of course, it was a well-known fact in the uranium sector that production costs were well below, or production costs were well above the current price. So we saw this need for, first of all, an investment fund to sweep up the unallocated inventory, and secondly, for a much broader uh, group of investors to start to build large-scale uranium production projects for the capacity that a larger nuclear grid would require. I think that's in the process of happening. I think it's very healthy. The rebound in uranium is healthy, and we think it's here to stay. And it's somewhat remarkable how much investor interest there is all of a sudden after having been, uh, you know, uh, very, very slow for many years. So uh, it's definitely a sector that's in the spotlight now. Thank you very much. And, and I turn to our last panelist, um, Richard Horrocks Taylor um, from Standard and Chartered. And uh, Richard, uh, um, you must see the ESG issues up up close. Um, uh, how, 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 what, what kind of insights can you give us uh, uh, into, into the, the demands of the capital market on e ESG at the moment and how informed perhaps the taxonomy is? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Tom. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I, think, I think as a, uh, you know, the energy transition is really the key theme that's driving, I think, all the activity um, within the sector at the moment, whether whether it's sort of the major mining companies selling coal assets um, through to really a rebalancing towards future facing metals. And that includes the battery supply chain, lithium, nickel, cobalt, other other commodities. Um, and we've been at the forefront of uh, advising groups in that in that space in the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, and I think what we what we do see is the, uh, you know, if you look at the Middle East uh, and you look at Saudi, um, the really exciting thing is it's perfectly placed to be at the center of the metals revolution that we're going to see in the next 20 to 30 years. It is the perfect place to, to produce renewable power and the ability to, over time, develop resources and an infrastructure to produce green hydrogen could fundamentally change the sort of metals and mining sector globally. So as a region, there's a upstream opportunity, which is the main focus of this conference. And I think there's a great, great initiative that's been taken by, by Saudi to sort of set up this conference this year. But I think the uh, uh, as we look at the supply chains and we look at uh, sustainability, um, really, the, 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 this region could really be the driver of the future for, for the sector. 
Um, and as we look at um, metals and mining, I think, you know, we as a group are thinking of changing our name to Transition Minerals because this is what the sector is about. And I think, you know, 15 years ago, everyone got super excited about the super cycle and investment into mining um, driven by China. Now we have a very different thematic and backdrop with a very different capital market sort of set up. Uh, you know, mining at the moment is, is, is less than 1% of the S&P 500. It's, um, it's been a rounding error for the last five or six years. Been very few banks that have been investing in metals and mining. Standard Chart is one of the few that has done that in terms of putting the team together under me that we had done in the last few years. And um, I'd say the opportunity here to, um, to reposition the sector is... Uh, is very bright, and I think that's why we've seen so much interest in this conference uh, over the next couple of days. So I think as we look at, um, you know, where 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 the, where the opportunity is going to be, uh, definitely there's a regional opportunity here, and I think Saudi uh, is taking a leadership role to sort of bring the investment in. But I think the link with that downstream metals hub and the opportunity to create. Uh, a much bigger presence, both upstream and downstream in the region, is going to be uh, uh, keeping bankers like myself and others uh, very busy around project financing, around bonds, uh, and obviously there's an equity capital markets and strategic equity angle to uh, raising capital. Uh, well, I think that's a, a very strong endorsement. One should always be pleased when the, uh, the bankers are enthusiastic about a sector. That's a, a good leading indicator. Um, I'd just like to ask the organisers if they can tell me how much time we have left, but I can't see any. Maybe we can just keep going until they stop us. <laughs> um, sorry? Sorry? 30 minutes. Uh, you've got about, uh, say, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, one, one question, I, I, and I don't know which of the panellists would like to take this that I'd like to put, is one of the challenges mining has is it is so energy intensive itself. Um, and, and the emissions it produces it through its process is, is one of its major challenges. And how significant is that as an issue for the industry? Uh, uh, and is it something, Ibrahim, I don't know if, if you'd like to address this, but is it something that, 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 that work is being done on, particularly in, in, in the kingdom where you see it as, as you know, a third pillar of the economy? Is that, is that an issue that is high on your list of things to address? Uh, I think also being a, um, an energy country uh, yep. with oil being uh, an industry we've had for decades already, we have experience with this. And when the Minister of Energy called for the circular carbon economy, front and center was the oil industry before even going to the mining industry, which is energy intensive in its own right to extract. I, I think focusing on you know, circular carbon economy is the main, at least from the kingdom perspective, and we, we took that in the agenda in the G20 last year, it's the main path forward. And if we are serious about addressing it, and as uh, the CEO of Barak said today, uh, we are adult about uh, understanding the challenge we have, and we'll look at it as adults, we will see that <coughs> circular carbon economy and leveraging some of that emission to help in the production itself is a path forward. We've had examples in um, with Saudi Aramco, with Sabic, where not only we reduce the emissions, but we leverage uh, the emissions themselves to facilitate the process. So we not only capture the and we use the carbon yes. uh, to, to reduce the footprint. And I think that as a path forward is the message we would like to convey. Um, I've just been informed that 10 minutes is five minutes. So, um, so, uh, uh, so what, uh, no, what, what I was going to do is, is actually ask each person, uh, each of the panelists, if they'd make, like to make a, a, a last remark or observation. Um, so I, uh, uh, we'll come back to you, Ibrahim. W w would you like to go next? Uh, I'll, I'll leave the word to, to my other colleagues here to go first. Okay. Well, we might ask you, Jeffrey, if you'd like to go, if you have any uh, observations. Well, I, I guess I, I'd say that 
you know, the sector of mining is global and local. So we're dealing with these global issues of reduction in the use of water, be more efficient with energy and technological solutions, solar power. We just saw witness the aqua uh, uh, power uh, agreement with Saudi Madden. So technology and this uh, new awareness, I think, will help uh, resolve this. We can't forget that there's enormous supply chains in in mining and mining projects that help and benefit the local area where the uh, mine is, is to be. And so with modern approaches to uh, on ESG, to dealing with the community, to making sure that the local economy uh, benefits as well, uh, we have a tremendous uh, good news story in so many of, of, of these uh, projects and possibilities. Um, uh, for the economy globally and, and, and locally. So uh, I like to remain uh, very bullish and as a Canadian, very supportive of this, uh, this sector and the, the players that are coming to the table uh, here at this conference and on this panel. It's uh, great to be with you. Thank you. Pe should we go to Peter and then Richard? Uh, sure. Well, just to um, perhaps state the obvious, the capital markets and investment funds are very much open for business in this sector. Uh, we're looking for opportunities, particularly those that can be commercialized. So uh, end markets and sophisticated investors like exist in this audience are uh, ideal partners to sponsor projects. And um, we would look forward to uh, trying to review some of those together. Thank you. Uh, let Richard give you the last word. Um, yeah, no, I think, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Saudi in the Middle East is extremely well placed um, to, to be really the crossroads and, and, and the heart of, uh, of the industry going forward. And I think we as a bank are keen to sort of play a role in bringing uh, not just investors, but, uh, you know, corporates globally uh, together and there's there's a real melting pot between uh, China and Asia um, and and other parts of the world that are looking to invest into into the region. So we're we're keen to be working uh, in Saudi where we've got a presence now and uh, within the region to to sort of to to drive that forward. So it's going to be an exciting few years, I think, with uh, uh, in, in 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 the region. I think we've now run out of time officially. Um, so uh, it, it remains to me to thank all of the panelists, particularly those that are up in the middle of the night or the early hours of the morning. Um, and let me just end on one note. I have been coming to the kingdom for 14 years on a very regular basis. One thing that I'm certain about is if the kingdom sets its mind to doing something, it will happen. And uh, th this country has changed completely in the time I've been coming Absolutely, here. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and it achieves its ambitions. So, uh, and it sets high benchmarks. And um, so, I um, thank you everyone for participating and thank you to, to those who have listened. Thank you.